Now you might say, well, perhaps they've come up with fatal flaws. Perhaps they've done experiments to test my views and have falsified it. I'd like to suggest they've done something completely different and that roles have been completely reversed. Piecing together the genetic puzzle, the science behind traced. Hey guys, I'm Brian Osborne here with Dr. Nathaniel Jensen here for video number 15 if you're keeping count of these. And I'm super excited about this particular episode. In this episode, what Dr. Jensen is going to do is really pull together so much of his research from the book Replacing Darwin. And then also, of course, his brand new book on traced and kind of looking at the data we find in those books, how we find great confirmations of what the Bible says in the science as you go through the information in those books. But also he's going to take all that and pull it together at the end. It gives a good summary of how science is confirming the Bible in these things and also make some really powerful predictions about what we should expect to see in the future. It's going to be great science and a great episode. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. Take it away. Thank you, Brian. And again, for our audience, if you're joining us live, this will be a finishing of the story that we we started in the previous episode. And we'll end, though, by bringing all of this together so that you can see there is this long, decade-long narrative of science of predictions and fulfillments. This is part 15. If you follow the YouTube numbering scheme, the reason we're talking about this, again, is because the conclusions in this new book, Traced, are within a young earth creation framework. It is not a mainstream view. And that naturally raises the question and should raise the question, how do we know this is true? Of course, if you're in science, you know that this is a question you should ask of every single conclusion out there when you're doing science, because the fundamental defining feature of science is questioning things, testing things. Again, to, to quote, to, to reiterate a quote that we've looked at multiple times in this series, from the evolutionary community, the most important feature of scientific hypotheses is that they are testable. That's not just a defining feature of the criticisms of creation science for 40 years. It's a fundamental aspect of the scientific method derived strictly from philosophy. My answer to this question, how do we know that the science in traced is true? Is because it's part of a historical progression of discoveries in which successive testable young earth creation predictions keep working. If you've followed us in episodes 11 through 14, you know that we did things a little bit out of order. I wanted to start with the Y chromosome aspect of this chronology because that's the main tool that we're using in this book, the Y chromosome being the male inherited DNA. But there's more to that story than that when we look at the entire decade of science. We began to go back to the very beginning in our chronology in the previous episode where we looked at the details on and, and and the results from the early experiments on mitochondrial dna we're going to finish part of that story talk about the last genetic compartment the one that constitutes the vast majority of our dna and then put all these pieces together to, to so that you can see there, there is a decade of experiments covering all the human genetic compartments that tells a coherent compelling narrative that leads to further further testable predictions in the future predictions from each of these compartments Again, we're looking at what we're, what we're calling the Y, excuse me, what we're calling the Rosetta Stone of human history. The new Rosetta Stone of human history is a DNA based generation by generation family tree for global humanity based on the male inherited DNA, the Y chromosome. And we spent several episodes focusing heavily on the sequence of events, the sequence of experiments, predictions and fulfillments as it relates to this specific male inherited DNA, this specific genetic compartment. We began looking at the complement to this, the mitochondrial DNA, it is not nearly as long as the Y chromosome. The total Y chromosome length is 60 million letters. The accessible part is about 10 million letters. The entire mitochondrial DNA sequence in humans is only 16,000 to 17,000 letters long. So it's just a tiny, tiny fraction of the total DNA. We looked at evidence last time in this one of the first major papers I published on this, indicating that there were multiple species, multiple phyla, that all pointed towards the same conclusion. If you look at the rate at which parents pass on mitochondrial DNA to their offspring and the rate at which they pass on erroneous versions, how many mistakes happen per generation? In each of these species, which were the only ones that I was aware of at the time that had this rate measured, because it, it's, it's fairly expensive and involved to do this. You can get a sequence from different species fairly easy. You just need one to do a statistically robust analysis of the rate at which parents make mistakes in their DNA and pass it on to offspring. 
that's a lot more a lot more effort involved. So there weren't tens of thousands of species with this sort of sequence, or even 2,700 species with this sort of data available, just four at the time. I'll talk about how this data set has expanded. But in each case then, at that time, when you apply the rates of change in roundworms, Canarabditis is a technical term, belongs to the phylum nematoda, but hey, it's, it's an animal species. Fruit flies, technical term is Drosophila. They belong to the phylum Arthropoda. Water fleas, technical term is Daphnia. And then of course, humans, so they belong to the phylum Chordata. These are all, also members of Arthropoda. So one phylum, these two are part of the same phylum, and then humans are a third phylum. All of them showed a very fast rate of change so that after millions of years or whatever, whatever the evolutionary time of origin is for these red bars, you get way more mutations than, than, are, than is even, even the total mitochondrial DNA size. So they'd, be multiplying, they'd be mutating this over and over and over again. Makes you wonder if these could survive that many millions of years of mistakes. Way more than what we actually see in green. The blue bars, again, you probably can't read these specific numbers at this level of zooming, but you can see the visual that what the young earth model in blue predicts overlaps exactly with what we see in green. True here, true here, true here, true here, in all four cases. So the fact that there's agreement in these conclusions across these data sets represents a strong argument for its validity. And again, we're trying to think of this narrative and we're trying to focus on the experiments that have relevance to the research in TRACED. TRACED deals with human history. At this early stage, we had human data, human mutation rate data that made predictions that meets the standard, the gold standard of science. Now, this of course is not something that the mainstream community took lying down. They had many objections to this, which if you've followed the previous episodes in this series will all be very familiar because there were similar objections made to what I've claimed with the Y chromosome data. Well, how do you know that the rate of change is consistent over multiple generations? Actually, in this case, several of these mutation rate studies were done over multiple generations. So one aspect of this criticism doesn't actually hold true. Instead, it's, well, fine, you can do it over multiple generations, but how do you know that over long periods of time, natural selection isn't going to play some sort of critical role in reducing the fast rate to some slower effective rate? And my answer to my mainstream colleagues is, what testable predictions does that view make? Let me put it in a more blunt way. The stereotype of creation scientists for many years has been that creation scientists say, God did it, I believe it, that settles it. That they make fun of it. They've made fun of creation science. Like, ah, you, God did it, that's your explanation for everything. It doesn't make any predictions. It just, that's your, that's your cover explanation for whatever data we come up with. If the evolutionary community is not careful, natural selection will become the God did it version. What predictions for the future does this natural selection model make? Based on natural selection, tell me how fast or how slow will the mutation rate be among Africans, among invertebrate species, mammal species, fish species. There are millions of species whose mitochondrial DNA mutation rates have yet to be measured. Make a prediction. I've put mine in print. That's the defining feature of science. Same thing holds true here. Well, how do you know this idea of natural selection of there being a difference between what we measure right now between parents and offspring and what, what, it, what it translates to in the distant past? That's, that's another way of, uh, the, the statement right here is another way of saying just that. The mutation rate would be the technical term for what's being measured between parents and offspring. Substitution rate is when we factor in all the other supposedly relevant factors to what's going on here. I say supposedly because again, if they're relevant, why does my model work? And if you want them to be scientifically relevant, there needs to be testable predictions. Then this last objection, which of course also showed up in our discussions of the Y chromosome, the male inherited DNA, what about mitochondrial DNA from fossils? Wouldn't that overthrow what I'm saying? Second paper, a couple years later, testing the predictions of these views. This is a paper looking at, again, the broader question of the origin of species, but the human data plays a role here again. And once again, it's we're looking at the uh, female inherited DNA in which mistakes are made each generation, just like the Y chromosome. Excuse me, I, I said something incorrectly. 
it's not that in humans, mistakes are made every generation. It's about every five to 10 generations, but there's this regular, apparently clock-like process. The fact that mitochondrial DNA records who you came from, who your mother is, and the fact that mutations are laid down regularly over successive generations, every five to 10 generations, means that the mitochondrial DNA records the who of human history as well as this element of the passage of time. Those two elements are the fundamental features of traditional family trees. And so mitochondrial DNA can function as a surrogate for a family tree. So here's an example then of a mitochondrial DNA based family tree. It's a record of female inheritance. I've displayed it this way. These are, this is about three to 400 humans, individuals, all living or from living people. This was not taken from fossils. And what I want you to know is something about the structure. I've not given an orientation to the tree where I've said, this is the beginning or this is the end, but you'll notice there is something that shows up sort of the bullseye. Yeah, you've got these long branches coming out this way. Once again, Africans, just like we saw in the Y chromosome tree, some of these African branches have, have, are very long when you display the tree this way. But the other thing I want you to notice is about this semi bullseye center is that there's three major nodes here. If you say time is the tips of these branches, well, you have to say that. However you orient the tree, the tips of the branches are always representing the present. I've excluded chimpanzee. I'm not making evolutionary assumptions about this. Just looking at humans. Time must be at the outward part here. I'm saying time moves from the outward inward sort of in a, in a bullseye manner. This would then represent some of the most ancient times. There's three major nodes. Why is that significant? If you look at the biblical history for mankind, the female anthropology, we all come from, according to Genesis 9, Noah's three boys and their wives. Noah's three boys, being males, would have gotten their mitochondrial DNA from their mother, and that's where it would have stopped. They would not have passed on their mitochondrial DNA to their offspring, because males don't do that, as best as we can tell. Instead, we would have all traced our mitochondrial DNA to the three wives of Noah's sons. The Bible doesn't say who they were, whether they were daughters of Noah and Mrs. Noah, whether they even were sisters of some other couple. They could have been somewhat unrelated. Another thing that throws a little bit of a an asterisk to all this is the scripture doesn't have hardly any detail on the pre-flood world. It does have this though. In Genesis 5, you have men, all of whom live a long time. The guy who lives short is, is Enoch, and he's only about 300 years, 300, 300 to 400 years in terms of his lifespan. The other guys all are, are about 900 years in length. They live long, and you can go from Adam down to Noah in about three generations. Now there's approximately 10 listed in Genesis 5, father, son, his son, grandson, you know, grandson, great grandson, so on. But I'm saying, if you look at how long Adam lived, he would have been alive when a, a, a distant relative, a distant offspring would have been born. That guy would have lived a long time. It would have been alive when Noah was born. Adam could have said something to that one guy and he could have spoken to Noah. And there's just that few steps between Adam and Noah. So what happened in the maternal line? Something similar could have been done. And so you could have very different genealogical steps that pass in these different lines of the wives of Noah's sons. My point in saying all that is the fact that you've got three major no's at the beginning seemed like a decent echo of this biblical anthropology. Seems like we're on the right track. Again, this is based on the DNA of living people. What if you throw in fossil DNA? That's what I did in this paper from 2015 from Neanderthals and Denisovans. You can't read these labels, but what I want you to see is based on the structure of the mitochondrial DNA tree, the female inherited DNA, you've got these three nodes that suggest this is a good place for the beginning of the tree. It also suggests and makes predictions, just like for the Y chromosome, that some of these long African branches probably mutated rates faster than five mutations per generation. I've put this in print very explicitly, I think in my papers, also in this book, Replacing Darwin. And no one's measured this yet. It's still a prediction, something to be done in the future. So 
With that model in mind, where do the fossil sequences show up? And what does it imply about their origins? They show up in this long African branch. No one's measured the rate of mutation in the African branches. I'm predicting that it's faster than the mutation rate we've measured in the non-African peoples, because that's all the data that we have for now, non-African mothers and daughters and such to measure this rate of mutation. These branches are even longer than the African ones, which would naturally imply that these have a super fast mutation rate. There's an alternative explanation for these long branches, and it could simply be that their DNA is degraded. Whatever's going on, there's something unusual about them, and the existence of these sequences, whether reliable or not, does not present a strong argument against what I'm doing. The structure of the mitochondrial DNA adds an additional line of evidence in addition to the mother-daughter mutation rate we just observed in what's, what was published in 2013. In other words, this early measurement, in a sense, predicted this later observation. And this presented a indirect argument against the reliability of Neanderthal DNA, or at least the ability of Neanderthal fossil DNA to contradict what I'm concluding. It isn't as strong a line of evidence as later came on for Y chromosome, but what I want you to see is that this skepticism of fossil DNA is something that has a long history. This skepticism has been criticized, yet it led to very strong data and observations several years later in the Y chromosome, which you can see in previous episodes. Again, this makes successful predictions. There was a, an early very strong agreement about among multiple lines of evidence from multiple species in different phyla. That itself, if you know statistics and biology, is, is, is powerful. It led to further observations in human DNA. Again, I'm trying to focus specifically on the human story, human narrative, because that's what Traced is talking about. There's more to that 2015 paper than, than I had time to go into. This shows the, the broader pattern of historical uh, historical progression of discoveries in which successive predictions keep working. I didn't start with Y chromosome. I started with mitochondrial DNA. There was an initial very powerful observation. There were objections that were raised. I tested some of those. It seemed to further confirm what the early observations had made. This makes further predictions. That's where we are in the story right now. One of these, one of the predictions it makes, or perhaps one of the objections that can be raised to all this is, again, if, if you go back in time and say we're in 2015, the only data we have right now genetically for the for the recent origin of humans is not Y chromosome, didn't have, hadn't published anything on that yet, didn't have a ton of data. And actually the, one of the first major studies of the Y chromosome, looking at what is the, the 1000 Genomes Project, that paper wouldn't get published for the Y chromosome until 2016 just so you know the sequence of events here and, and what data we do and do not have. Mitochondrial DNA, readily available, lots of sequences out there, hundreds, thousands of humans with published mitochondrial DNA sequences, went that direction first, saw this pattern of results that seemed to fit the young earth time scale. And so we stopped and said, good enough, we can satisfy our supporters. No, we're doing science. We make even more Tesla predictions. Perhaps even if you kind of break the chronology here for a moment and say, well, I've presented mitochondrial evidence, female inherited DNA. I presented evidence for Y chromosome DNA. I've ignored 99% of our DNA, the DNA we get from both parents, biparentally inherited, both parents. What, what does young earth say about this? Well, back to the chronology. Again, I'm starting with mitochondrial DNA, finding some initial results that seem to be working, test them some more, they seem to keep working. Yes, maybe the evidence against fossils isn't that strong, but I keep going and doing experiments to see if these predictions keep working, further evaluate. And what I go to next then is this autosomal DNA or the DNA from both parents, which again, you've got generation by generation mistakes that occur, but it's both the mother's side and the father's side because DNA is coming from both directions then. I'm a, I, my DNA is a mix of both of my parents' DNA. And long story short, paper I published 2016 in collaboration with Jason Lyle, has this fundamental observation. I'll use humans as an example. I'll, I'll show you a, another figure from that paper, there's, but there's a lot more there than what I have time to tell you right now. The fundamental observation here is that the mitochondrial clock data contradicted this autosomal clock data. So again, when I say autosomal, I mean from both parents, the 99% of the DNA. And this contradiction is true for both creation and evolution. You might say, oh, ah, you found a contradiction to your view. 
Actually, I found a contradiction for both views. Let me explain it this way. This image from the paper shows you the results from a young earth framework. Here, once again, is we've got the measurement of mothers and daughters, how fast or slow mitochondrial DNA mutates. You might say, where's the Y chromosome data? We didn't have it yet. That's that's where we were at in, in, in the broader, not just the young earth, but broader mainstream picture of where things were at. A lot of the Y chromosome data was in the recent past, last few years where this has been discovered. So at that time, we've got mitochondrial data, we've got autosomal data, DNA from both parents. Here I'm calling it the nuclear uh, SNV, a single nucleotide variants. Homo sapiens, our species. So once again, we already had this data for humans where the, the rate of change in mitochondrial DNA has been measured to be fast. And it captures the known amount in, in dark gray, black, of mitochondrial DNA differences that exist among non-Africans in the world today. Do a similar calculation for the autosomal nuclear DNA, DNA from both parents. The rate is about around roughly, it, it, it varies, but it's around 80 mutations, 60 to 100 mutations per generation. From a young earth perspective, in a sense, you could say that's slow. You're not going to get that many mutations in just 6,000 years. Hence, you can't even see this orange bar right here. You can see the top of this dashed orange line, the top of the range of predictions. It's way under the, the millions of autosomal or biparentally inherited DNA differences that exist among humans today. That's the contradiction. Mitochondrial clocks seem to argue for a recent origin. These autosomal clocks are not consistent with that. The reverse is true for evolution. Over hundreds of thousands, millions of years, this bar would go up and would capture what we see, but so would this. In this case, for the evolutionary view, the long old earth creation view, you might be able to explain your autosomal differences in the long time scale, but you still have this strong contradiction with mitochondrial DNA. That's what I mean. There's a contradiction for both views. They can explain one compartment and not the other. What you can explain for young earth might be mitochondrial DNA, but not autosomal. For evolution, you can explain autosomal, but not mitochondrial. So what do you do? And by the way, this is true across species, across kingdoms. So by this time, we didn't just have animal data. We also had, or animal and human data. We also had fungal data, Saccharomyces, Baker's yeast. And even on the young earth timescale, these guys mutate so fast, you get a massive amount of DNA differences in a short amount of time. If you look at the nuclear, the autosomal DNA differences for yeast, you get an underestimate. And again, things get reversed basically for the evolutionary model. So we had multiple independent confirmations of a contradiction, multiple examples observing a contradiction between maternally inherited DNA and the DNA inherited from both parents. Again, it's true for both models. So both models have to find a way to make sense of this. So here's the challenge I see for evolution. Evolutionists might say, well, yeah, we can explain all of our autosomal differences by mutation. And because that's the bigger compartment, we're not even going to try mitochondrial DNA. Now, that would be ridiculous because science doesn't just throw up its hands and say, ah, we're not going to try. It's not like it's some debate. Science is a process of knowing the world. So when you've got a contradiction, you've got to try to resolve it. Oftentimes, contradictions hold the keys to new discoveries about the world and resolving them is a, is a key step of the scientific process. Anyone who gives up at this stage and throws his hands up and says, I'm done, I've solved the debate, is not thinking scientifically. So what's evolution going to do? Natural selection, of course, is something that might come to mind. So let's, let's chase that hypothesis for a moment. Again, you have to do a mental transformation here. This is the results for a young earth view. In 6,000 years, you can explain mitochondrial DNA. You can't explain the nuclear, the autosomal DNA with, with mutations in 6,000 years. Reverse is true for evolution. Yeah, we can explain the autosomal DNA. This, this bar goes way up for hundreds of thousands, millions of years for evolution. But so does this bar. So how do you bring this blue bar back down for the evolutionary model? Maybe natural selection eliminated these mutations. Okay, why didn't it eliminate these? Again, you have to mentally think about a tall orange bar, a way super tall blue bar. So if you bring the blue bar down with natural selection, why doesn't natural selection work over here? If the evolutionary model is not careful, they can degenerate into a version of, well, God did it. Well, how do you know when God does or doesn't do things? How do you know when evolution, or excuse me, how do you know when natural selection does or doesn't do things? If you're constantly after the fact manipulating the data with this 
flexible plastic explanation. It's not an explanation at all. It's not science, it's pseudoscience. So there's a great danger in evolution trying to explain this contradiction. What about young earth view? God did it. Is there some arbitrary, willy-nilly invoked model for what's going on to explain these sorts of differences? If you read the paper, and to make a long story short, a basic understanding of the biology is what makes tremendous sense of this contradiction, and I think does a better job resolving this contradiction than the evolutionary model does it resolving its own contradiction. Here's what I mean. I've got the statements here on the screen, but I'll explain them because they're technical terms. I said created heterozygosity versus mutations. What in the world am I talking about? Well, let's go back to the biology, and this will, I think, help bring this to light. Mitochondrial DNA, as I've mentioned, comes, as best as we know, only through moms, uniparental, uni, one, one parent, not both. So in the beginning, let's, let's think out the, think through the implications of this from a biblical perspective to see where this leads. Is there some sort of rational, internally consistent explanation? Think about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve both have mitochondrial DNA, but again, only moms pass it on. So effectively, there was a single copy of mitochondrial DNA in the beginning as best as we can tell. Adam had it, but his is irrelevant to explain the differences that we see today. You can't say, uh, excuse me, you could say that God created Adam's mitochondrial DNA sequence that's different from Eve's, but even if you invoke it, it has no effect on the differences that we see today because Adam doesn't pass it on. Were all the products of Eve's mitochondrial DNA sequence and mutations to it? I don't see any other plausible way to explain that. What about the autosomal DNA? How would Adam and Eve's DNA have looked in the beginning? Now, for all of us, all of us are the product of two parents because Homo sapiens, humans, are a sexually reproducing species, not an asexually reproducing species. All of us, by definition, have two parents and DNA from both parents. You can see this if you were to look at your DNA under a microscope. Look at the chromosomes. Here's 46 chromosomes. It's from a male. And what you can see here is that some of these chromosomes are long, some are short, but in every case, these wet noodle looking structures have a, come in pairs. For every long chromosome, there's a, there's a pair that matches its length. For every short chromosome, there's a pair. One exception, of course, being this over here, that's X and that's a Y, meaning this is a male. The bigger point I want you to see is that the fact that these come in pairs is due to the biology of sexual reproduction. One member of each pair comes from mom, one member of each pair comes from dad. That's how my DNA looks or would look. One version from mom, one version from dad. And there's differences between those two versions because mom has a different ancestry than dad. Maybe you see where I'm going with this. How would Adam's DNA have looked? He does not have biological parents. He's created from dust. So would God have created Adam with the appearance of having parents. Well, isn't that deceptive, you might say? No, because the Bible tells us how he was created. And frankly, I want to consider the alternative. I'm going to argue that this is, in fact, the best version of, of uh, the version of young earth creation that makes the most sense. Consider the alternative. Let's say God creates Adam with two identical versions of his DNA. Eve is made from his side. She has the same identical versions of her DNA, with one exception being she has two X chromosomes, not XY. In other words, let's say that you consider the, the opposite version where God creates Adam and Eve with no differences within their DNA or between them, with the sex chromosomes being the exception. They would have reproduced, they would have fulfilled the command to be, to, to be fruitful and multiply, essentially by cloning. That's what producing genetically identical offspring is. Cloning. That strikes me as a little bit odd from a theological perspective. And what I think makes more sense is to give Adam and Eve the ability to be fruitful and multiply from the beginning. So Adam is created with different versions of his DNA so that when they have children, they can produce a whole spectrum of so-called racial differences, ethnic differences. They can have a diversity of offspring just like that. Eve is created from a side. She likely has the same two different versions of her DNA. You might say, okay, you're, you're basically the same. Adam and Eve are genetically identical. Yes and no. There's a technical explanation for this, so bear with me. The way DNA differences are measured today, if you apply that methodology, 
back to Adam and Eve, they would have been more genetically different from each other than two people are from each other today. So if some people are saying, oh, ew, this is weird, that Adam and Eve would have the same DNA. They both would have two different versions, but this two different versions, Eve's, Eve's DNA would have looked like this too. And uh, actually, by definition, they would have been the most genetically diverse people on this planet that ever lived. You and I are more closely genetically identical than they were. Wait, how's that true? We can talk about it another time, but it, it has to do with the quirks of how DNA differences are measured. There's a lot of differences that still exist today. And anyway, I don't have time to go into it, but there isn't an ew factor unless you want to talk about any two other people marrying today as also being you. My point is we have good reasons theologically, and I would argue scientifically. I go through the scientific reasons in this paper to postulate that Adam is created with DNA differences from the start. Evolution says all differences are the result of mutation. There's no possibility for the creation of differences. And again, same song, second verse for Eve. She would have been created with differences between her two versions of DNA, allowing her to be fruitful and multiply, produce a diversity of offspring. Evolution says no, there is no such thing as created differences. These are all the product of mutation. So why am I even invoking this? Let's again compare mitochondrial DNA to autosomal DNA. At the beginning, there's one version effectively. You can't have created differences between Adam and Eve for mitochondrial DNA because Adam doesn't pass it on. I mean, you could have Adam's version being created different, but it makes no difference to what we see today because we don't know what his version would be. It wasn't passed on. Autosomal DNA is inherited differently. There's a different biology that applies. And so it's rational to invoke a different mechanism of origin, God creating differences in Adam and Eve. This would bring this discrepancy into alignment. If you say, sure, you can't produce very many mutational differences in 6,000 years. That's because the vast majority of these differences are not mutated, but created. Now, if you follow me so far, you might say, that's arbitrary. That's basically a version of God did it. That's not science. That's what I thought when I first heard this view. I was resistant to it until I realized that this view makes testable predictions. What this model implies is that the vast majority of the DNA differences that exist in our planet today have been created and therefore created for a purpose and are functional. So my counter argument to my evolutionary colleagues is, tell me, predict for me, based on your view of no created differences, everything the result of mutation, how many of our DNA differences are functional and how many are non-functional? That question is harder to answer than you might imagine. Because once again, what role does natural selection play and what role doesn't it play? Predict for me precisely with mathematical precision. How many of the nuclear autosomal DNA differences are functional? How many are not? So just to summarize again, both evolution and creation, when it comes to biparentally inherited DNA, autosomal DNA, DNA comes from both parents, 99% of our DNA. There's this inherent contradiction when you look at how many differences you can explain by mutation alone. I think evolution has trouble trying to reconcile why mitochondrial DNA clocks, mutation rates are fast, but these seem to be slow. My explanation for resolving this discrepancy is that you have to consider the different biologies. This is inherited through one parent. This DNA is inherited through both parents. This type of DNA, by definition, can be explicable by God creating differences in Adam and Eve. You can't do it this way. This makes testable predictions. So does this. What's evolution going to do? And the bigger point is, 2013, 2015, I had come up with an explanation for mitochondrial DNA that argued for a recent origin for humanity. When we brought in this additional data set, the most rational, rational explanation ended up confirming what the 2013, 2015 results had concluded. There was a consistency across several years, across multiple data sets. So now that's essentially the entirety of the story. Again, the first several episodes in this little mini series went through just the Y chromosome data, sort of fast forwarded to 2017, 18, 19, 2020, so forth, because that's when the big action happened. 
But this larger scientific narrative starts in 2013, not with Y chromosome, but with maternally inherited DNA, because again, we didn't have the Y chromosome data at that point. The initial results pointed towards recent origin. They were further confirmed by the structure of the DNA, the, the mitochondrial DNA tree. There was initial lines of evidence arguing for skepticism of the reliability of ancient DNA. As more and more data sets were added, not just mitochondrial, but autosomal, the DNA you get from both parents. It confirmed indirectly the initial conclusions for mitochondrial DNA. And now is the point at which we can say, fine, you've got this initial data set for mitochondrial DNA that seems to be working, has predictions. Additional data set for, for autosomal DNA that seems to be working, makes predictions. What about the Y chromosome? And you actually can see this if you, if you follow the evolutionary blogs. This was one of the counter arguments in 2016. He's ignored Y chromosome DNA. And now we can bring in the sequence of predictions, fulfillments, predictions, fulfillments that I alluded to and walked you through step-by-step step in previous episodes. For Y chromosome, the data get even better and stronger. So what used to be a counter argument, he's ignored the Y chromosome historically, has become one of the strongest arguments in print for the recent origin of humanity because we can measure father-son mutation rates. They're fast given high quality data. Well, what about, what about, come up with whatever objection you want to, why did this successfully predict global population growth curves, which successfully predicted matches between the genetic data from a, y, from a young Earth perspective and regional population growth curves? Why was this, this match between that, that young Earth-based Y chromosome tree and then this data set based on non-genetics, instead uh, archaeology and historical records at a regional level? Why, why are these matches occurring? Well, what, 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 whatever but, but, but you come up with, why did it then predict and confirm the history of civilization in the Y chromosome tree. But, but, but what about, why did this predict the Genesis 10 echo at the base of the tree? And again, and again, the point is, it's not that I'm suddenly glomming together a bunch of data and say, hey, this all fits. There's a sequence of this initial data works. So it predicts this, we test it, it works again. So it predicts this, we test it, it works again. There's a sequence through time, which is exactly the element that evolutionists have demanded, testable predictions that continue to work and as we just saw in the previous episode, it sets up this comprehensive, massive set of predictions about the rate at which we should discover new branches. I've already seen this begin to work. It's the basis for the research going forward. So without getting into the details all over again, you've got several years of predictions, fulfillments in the Y chromosome tree. Long story short, all the DNA compartments that we can look at in humans have revealed a cohesive, coherent narrative over an entire decade that points towards the recent origin of humanity. There's a tremendous amount of science, a very big puzzle with a lot of pieces that's come together to give rise to the conclusions that we find and traced. I still don't buy it. I don't expect you to. The defining feature of science is skepticism. My challenge to you is if you're skeptical, are you willing to join the search for future confirmations. Are you willing to continue to test this model? I am. And if you're not, I'm going to wonder if your skepticism is scientific in nature. Because that's the defining feature of science, not my definition. Science is defined by testable predictions. And I'm doing science and I'm continuing to doing science based on the research and traced. And anyone who says this is not scientific should welcome the future evaluation, my own attempts to criticize and falsify my model. That's what science is. That's what scientists do. This book is built on research that I summarized in this book. Again, this is not a prerequisite to understand trace, but I want you to know if you're skeptical of what's going on in trace, there's a whole long series of experiments, testable predictions, fulfillments that I think presents a strong case. Again, you don't have to agree with me, but why has it been working for a decade? Why am I still pursuing it? And shouldn't everyone be eager to see if it keeps working? Just from a purely scientific perspective, anyone who wants to see science advance should welcome predictions, fulfillments. Let's find new ways to explore the world, see if there's things we've missed. Let's look for chinks in the established armor. We're going to get to in the future some specific criticisms. Because what I want you to see then, I, I've sort of given you the overview of my perspective of my work. What we're going to do in future episodes is, is look at specific criticisms put in print of trace. And, and, and I've already sort of teased you with this in earlier episodes. What I think you'll see is 
that the evolutionary community, the mainstream scientific community has given creation science a great gift. Now you might say, well, perhaps they've come up with fatal flaws. Perhaps they've done experiments to test my views and have falsified it. I'd like to suggest they've done something completely different and that roles have been completely reversed. Actually, it's in a sense, I think an unforced error, a great gift. You don't have to take my word for it. We'll get to it in the future. That's where we're going. But I want you to see, here's where we've come from. You can connect with me on, on multiple channels and social media. Again, we'll put up here at the bottom of the screen if you want to participate in this future research that I plan on continuing to do. It's antisongenesis.org slash go slash traced. There's still so much more to come. I see this project taking me the rest of my life and we still won't be finished. But the point is, creation science isn't this quack idea that a bunch of religious fundamentalists and fanatics pursue to, to make themselves feel good. It's a full-fledged scientific idea that meets the highest standards of science that evolutionists have demanded. It's been working, and so I'm still chasing it and intend to do so for quite a long time to come. Absolutely love it. I wish you were just a bit more passionate, Dr. Jensen, on this issue. That would help. Uh, no, it's coming through loud and clear, and I hope you guys are catching that passion as well and the passion of really doing science and seeing science confirm the Bible again and again. And whether you're talking about really mitochondrial DNA, whether you're talking about the Y chromosome, all the research, we're having multiple independent lines of evidence confirming that biblical perspective, that younger time scale, and that connection back to one real person and Adam back at the beginning, Adam and Eve, those first two people. And it's just amazing to watch that be fleshed out. And I can't wait for what's to come later on down the road. So I know you guys have enjoyed this as well. I'm sure stay tuned for what's coming. Like Dr. Jensen said, this is just the beginning. How exciting is that? And so it is just the beginning. Stay tuned for coming uh, research that will be unveiled. And I can't wait to see how that all fleshes out. Uh, but again, if you want more on this, be sure you go check out the book Traced. It has so much more. You think you got a lot now? Go to the book. There's so much more in there. It'll really bring it to life in a more vivid way for you as you go through the book, see the wonderful graphs that are in the book, kind of piece all that together. It really is so helpful. And then actually help you understand this even better and pull it all together. And then if you haven't got the book Replacing Darwin, also a fantastic read, very, very powerful. And uh, it's also helpful in illuminating uh, some questions in regards to these issues of genetics and kind of pulling all together as Dr. Jensen did in this particular episode. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Be on the lookout for coming research and we will see you guys later on.